welcome to another edition of Reasonable Doubt, brought to you by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. I'm your host, Jimmy Ardwan, back with my co-host, Julio Vela. What's going on? We had a little unexpected break last week. A little bit, a little bit, a couple days off. It led to cabin fever, led to my kids going crazy, mm -hmm. yeah. led to, yeah, you know, and this and this and this, but. Ice, some snow, we've had it all this year. We have, we have. Anytime I'm sitting next to, though, a fellow South Texan, Lori Botello, Hey. Running Republican judge. Yeah. Ford, uh, as a Republican Ford judge. Yes. I'm pumped. Lori, how you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me, guys. No, it's good to have you on the show. You're uh, out, of, out of our series of candidates that we're going to be having here. Uh, you're the first Republican to appear on the show. We've uh, extended oh. invitations to a bunch of other candidates on both sides. As as we told you two weeks ago, sorry, we uh, we encountered a little bit of a issue last week we couldn't get on the air last week but that's okay we're on this week and so uh Lori's here to join us and you know we'll be here the next hour talking with her about her campaign we'll talk about some current event issues going on at the courthouse you can hit us up i have twitter on you can hit us up at, eight, at hccla underscore tv or call on the phone 713-807-1794 is the number so Lori, what um what made you want to do this <laughs> and I say Good that, and, well, and, and, and I know that's such a trite question. Everybody asks that, but you know, look, um, we, we the judges get judges are politicians essentially. I mean, you're running as a as a politician, you get criticized, mm. and uh, I, you know, I get along with some judges. I have I may not see eye to eye with some others, and we all have different relationships with judges. A at the end of the day, though, I I view the judges as kind of the quarterback of an NFL team hmm. you know you get or you know you get all the all the blame when it goes wrong <laughs> uh, and not enough of the glory when you start doing things right you hmm. know I mean oh, well more, maybe more like a head coach because I guess the quarterback does get a lot of the credit but maybe more like a head coach you know you really don't get enough credit when things go right but man you get an earful when things are done wrong or when when people don't like it and it's just like any other politician i mean we're, we're seeing it now that there's this kind of backlash of things so what makes you want to get into this whole realm of politics well i first thought about running in 2013 for the 2014 election cycle and i just hear so many complaints from lawyers about you know judges policies how they act on the bench, the timeliness at which they arrive to court. And I was practicing in Montgomery County, Fort Bend County, federal court. And so I got to see how different judges ran their courts. And I got to practice in front of lots of different judges. And I thought, I have some ideas to run a good court, to be a place where lawyers enjoy coming to practice, to be a place where um, we could do some things more efficiently instead of the waiting around and the yeah, waiting around. So um, hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. But I did. I did get. I did get pregnant uh, the fall of 2013, and so that put off that decision. And so when this cycle came up, a bunch of judges were considering retirement, and I just seized the moment as soon as I first filed when Larry Stanley decided to retire. I first filed for court six, and I decided I'm going to do this. So let's go. Let's let I'll, me let me do it. Allow me to to say. Uh, I'm mean, the co-host. Well, I love yeah. Judge Bull. Mm. Okay, Judge Bull has been on the bench for a number of years. Uh, she's always had a fair trial. She's always, always given me a fair shake. And you're running for County Criminal Court of Law number 11. Yes. So let me ask you this. Is it going to be, is there a new Republican movement or is it is it going to be the same policies that are coming in or what? What new things do you bring to the table, or is it going to be more of the same, which, quite frankly, Judge Bull r runs a good court? She does. I agree with you. I think she runs a great court, and I have a lot of respect for her. There's been so many changes, though. Hurricane Harvey were displaced, so we've had to share courtrooms. We've had to change how we do um, jury trials. We've got these jail dockets. I mean, we're, we're covering a lot of ground as, as lawyers. And uh, I went to a meeting this morning and I heard Ed Emmett say that the plan is to rebuild the criminal justice system from the inside. So not tear down the building, but redo it interior. 
Um, who knows where the, the courts are going to be? Who knows where the DA's office is going to be or public defenders as, as far as like location, which floors. But I think now's the time with all this change going on to streamline some of the policies. We've got e-filing that just started. We're navigating that kind of rocky road right now. But I think with a lot this, of rants about that, too. There are a lot of rants about e-filing. And you know, it's just like everything, when something new happens, you've got to adjust. And I'm sure. People, people say they want change, but then when they get change, they don't like it. This right. is, this right. is you right. know, kind of the conundrum that, that people are in that. You know, and, and, and unfortunately, that's I go back to my initial question, because as a politician, you have to be the one to implement changes. Yes. And uh, a lot of people are not going to like that change. They're, they're, they, they may come back and say, well, I can't believe she did that. You sure. know, I mean, you're, you're going to have people that have been your colleagues that will say, well, I can't believe she did that as a <laughs> They're, you know, <laughs> already. What, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. you're bound to get that. I am. And um, I mean, you're, in a, you're I, I don't know. I mean, and I've never run for politics. I've never been a judge, but I, I just kind of see it as in some situations you're just in a in a lose lose position. I mean, take for instance this week, with, with what happened with the ice. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, it it is if they if they don't shut down the courthouse in time, uh, they're evil because how can they make people come to court? Uh, and forfeit bonds mm -hmm. and everything else. If if they're trying to work and see what they can do and tell people be safe, we're not going to forfeit bonds. Uh, you know, everybody's uh, the, the, don't blame trying them. to. They're, right. Yeah, they'll blame them for right. whatever. I mean, <laughs> whatever they try to do, whatever right. the judges try to do, it, there, there's always going to be a cadre of of critics who come out and say, well, that just wasn't the right thing to do. I, I just can't believe they didn't do that. Why why can't why can't we just all get on HISD schedule? Why can't they make it uniform? Right. And I mean, I understand that argument, but you know, the things there has to be a process of by which things change. Right. There's no uniformity. And maybe that that can be a change. Maybe there can be a streamline of the policies. I know that was a big topic of discussion this week about closing the courthouse. Um, do we make people come down? Roads might ice in the afternoon. Are they going to get home safely? I mean, there was a big discussion about it, and ultimately the majority of courts closed. I think they still had jail docket because people are in custody and they still are needing representation. But instead of being in that cadre of critics, I want to be someone who can affect change. Yeah. I want to be a part of the group that sits down and say, says, okay, how can we make this better? Or what can we do to streamline the process? Do you think you can, uh, Lori? You're a, you're a, a, I've known you for years now. Mm -hmm. Fabulous defense attorney. Thanks. Um, do you think you can handle it? Do you think you can handle the the politics part of it? You got thick enough skin for it? Uh, the politics part has definitely been interesting. I knew. I knew that I was in for the unexpected. I knew there was no way I could anticipate this roller coaster ride. And it has truly been a roller coaster ride, but I, I do have thick skin. And it's, for the most part, it's been a rewarding experience. I've met so many people, and I've met a lot of people who were saying, you know, yes, thank you for running. Thank you for, you're young and you're Latina and you speak Spanish and you bring a whole perspective that, you know, we haven't seen on, on the benches in Harris County, or we've seen too little of. So it's nice to hear that. It's words of encouragement for sure. What is Lori, what do you bring to the table? What are you, you coming in? So you're a young, mm -hmm. uh, Republican, <laughs> strong person. Yeah. What, what do you bring to the table? I mean, is it is it that? What else, what distinguishes you from everyone else? We're all individuals. I bring to the table um, conservative family values. I grew up strict Catholic. And I have two little girls, so I bring my conservative values from my upbringing to the table. I bring an energy that I think has been missing for a while in our misdemeanor courts. Um, I'm ready to work hard. And I can assure lawyers that I'm going to follow the law. I'm going to give everyone a fair shake um, because I've been on our side. And our clients all have different stories. And whether they're guilty or not, we still need to provide a defense. We still need to listen to their stories, look at the evidence. And so now, instead of being a quarterback or a, a, I don't know, first baseman, I'm trying to use sports analogies here, I'm going to be a pretty good referee. I think I'm going to be able to call the balls and strikes. And if I don't know the answer, I'm not afraid to say, all right, let's take a break. 
let me go do my own research, look up the law, or send me your briefs. I'm happy to read them. I'll make a decision in a couple days or what, or you know, whatever's appropriate. You brought up the fact that you're Catholic. Mm -hmm. Do you see that influencing you, influencing you on the bench, or do you feel that? Um, how do you feel that's going to impact you on the bench, or is it even going to be something that will impact you on the bench? Well, I don't. I don't think I'm going to bring religion to the table. I'm going to follow the rule of law as written. And I reference my, my upbringing because I grew up in a conservative household where family is important. And being a judge on a bench, we hear, we hear from our defendants all the time, you know, I need to support my family. I need to get back to work. Coming to court so often for all these resets is hard for me to do because I'm missing work or I need to be with family. And so having that perspective, I'm all for having longer reset periods for the cases that need it. I'm all for having a call docket so we can order the cases up for trial and not have people just come to court endlessly when they don't need to so that they can work, so that they can take care of family, so that they can, you know, live their lives and, and still participate and be, you know, handle their case, but not miss so much work, not miss so much family time. You've talked about uh, resets and getting longer resets. How do you plan on doing that? Do you have a plan for that? I do. So, um, for example, a DWI case. When there's blood involved, it traditionally takes, what, 90 to 120 days to get blood results back. Bail reform issues aside right now, um, usually those defendants are supervised while they're on bond. I don't see the need for them to come to court every 30 days unless they're accused of having a violation. If they're blowing positive into their interlock device and they're drinking alcohol, they need to come to court and we need to see what's up or if they are um, missing appointments, missing random urinalysis tests, they need to come to court. But otherwise, let them go and be supervised, blow into their machine, report like they're supposed to, follow their instructions, and then come to court when we know we're gonna have their blood result back. Right. I think that just makes sense. You talked about things of uh, interlocks, blow schedules, or random urinalysis. What are your, what's your opinions on those? I mean, what's your stand? I know every case is different, but mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your feelings on those types of things? Are they good? Are they bad? Well, I think that the bond conditions are for the safety of the community. I heard um, a statistic, and I know I don't have these numbers right, but they're, the citizens of Harris County far outnumber the number of police patrolling the streets. So if someone gets pulled over for a DWI, it's pretty egregious driving or it's it's an accident that's occurred and to me in a DWI case for instance those bond conditions are just guaranteeing the safety of the community because we don't want that same person who may or may not have a drinking problem to be out on the road intoxicated again because God forbid there be an accident serious injuries occur maybe death we want to, and, and Houston is a town of drivers. We don't have the public transportation that other cities do. We're all driving, so we need to be sure for the protection of the community that those drivers are safe. Do you feel that um, there could be other, or will you explore other means of, of supervision while people are on bond? If, for example, we hear people, we hear some judges using the patch, we have some judges using the interlock, we have some judges using the scram device. Are you open mm. to those types of things or, or, or do you have limits? I've heard the rumors about the unpredictability of the scram device. Right. So if elected, I want to research more about that to see is it truly effective or is it just a really expensive, <laughs> unpredictable piece of machinery that's not a good gauge for whether someone's drinking or not. Um, I've also heard of the patch, but all of the, these things are expensive, and that, that to me, I hear it all the time. I can't, Miss Botteo, I can't afford to get a scram on my ankle. It's $400. I don't have $400, and I'm a court-appointed lawyer, so that truly means when they say they're indigent, if they can't afford a lawyer, they definitely can't afford a machine like that. And so it, it's a possible, I want to do more research on these things before I start signing orders, making people have these devices. You talk about poor people uh, not being able to afford things like interlock and the patches and the scram devices. Um, what's your opinion on ordering poor people or people who can't afford it to have them um, 
is that something that's being discussed in within the judiciary or within the cam uh, within the campaign trails as how are you going to get around that because these poor people they can't afford the scram they can't afford the interlock um, is there discussions about that and what's your opinions on it I haven't had discussions like that with any members of the judiciary and no one's really brought it up on the campaign trail but it is an interesting area that we need to look more into you know judge um, a, 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 a fearless innovator and <laughs> champion I mean it judge Stanley mm. um, I had a client she she couldn't uh, afford the interlock mm -hmm. so judge ordered her said fine you can't afford the interlock then guess what then you come downtown it was still cumbersome it was but you come downtown you take a drug test every week mm -hmm instead of mm -hmm. uh, the machine. Yes. And she did it. And ultimately, we ended up getting a good resolution to her case. She, and um, things like that. So do you believe that the judiciary should be using uh, pre things like pretrial services, those resources, uh, for people on bond and such? Definitely. I think that's a big help because the, judici the judicial Members can't do it themselves. I think pretrial services has really done a good job stepping up, especially after this bail reform. Uh, new practice had to come into play. <coughs> and so, I, and I think it's good that these judges, that they have options. Um, and I hope to say in the future that we have options. Um, but ultimately, you know, it is case by case. I do even have clients who say, oh, I'm, I am driving, don't tell judge. And it's like, what am I going to do me. with you? Don't tell me. Don't either. tell me either. <laughs> and it's it, it, it's hard. You have to say you've got to get this machine. The machine's the cheapest device on the market, actually. Right. If y'all weren't aware. Right. So Easy. it's just put the machine in a car. Just put the machine in your put car. Put the machine in a car. Yes. Yeah. No. Now you do have an opponent in the primary. Yes. Uh, and Aaron Burdett, who we have invited on the show, um, he is not committed to coming on a date yet. Uh, hopefully he will commit on a date to come on as well so we can get uh, his views and, and hear his story as well. But uh, he's a prosecutor. He's been a prosecutor, I, get, I think, his entire career as far as I know. Mm -hmm. uh, how about you? What, what, where did you start out how, in the practice of law? Have you been Ooh. a prosecutor? Have you done other things? I have never things? been a prosecutor, ever. Okay. And that was a choice I made. Um, I think in college I had so many jobs that my dad couldn't keep track. And he said, you know... Lori, you just need to work for yourself. You need to be your own boss, run your own business. That's where you're going to be successful. And he was spot on right. I graduated. He's somewhat overrated sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been a blast. Um, it's, it's, it's been great to be solo practitioner. I started doing real estate transaction work right out of law school. Because Fascinating. No, it was so, it was not. Like doing title work and stuff? D writing loan documentation, oh. um, some oil and gas, researching um, the chain of t title. Oh, it was like a landman. No, <laughs> it was just even like a more, little bit of everything. Okay. And the market started to tumble in 2007, so I was looking for other things to do. And uh, a friend who's actually at the PD's office, public defender's office, invited me to some CLE for criminal uh, cases, and I said, sure, and I really enjoyed learning about it. And then he said, you know, with this, with this CLE, you could get on the list in Galveston. And I was like, really? Oh, okay, and I filled out the paperwork, and I had a couple of cases and two weeks later, and it was just never looking back. What thrills you of being a defense attorney? What is it? Is it the, is it the closing argument? Is it the opening? Is it a trial? Is it the motions? Is it impacting people? What does it for you as a defense lawyer? Um, as a defense lawyer? <laughs> it's, uh, it's hearing people's stories and hearing everyone has a side to the story. And it's also looking at the evidence, making sure that the government did its job and didn't you know, overstep their bounds or make any shortcuts. And then I had my first trial in 2012, uh, actually 12, 12, 12, and it was a not guilty. And I just remember doing voir dire, talking to the jurors, that having that conversation, that was just like, that was awesome. And so that's actually my favorite part of the trial is voir dire, talking to the jurors and getting feedback. And I'm still strategizing when I'm doing voir dire. And so that's exciting to me. And thinking on my feet, 
Because we don't know what to expect in trial. I mean, we, we, we know what the evidence we think it will show, but we don't know what a witness is going to say or because often they won't talk to us before trial. So that's exciting, having to think on your toes and you hear something bad and, oh, objection, you know, that's, that's exciting to me. Do you find that being, you mentioned you were a, you've only been a defense attorney. Yes. Do you find that uh, there's a difference uh, and I'm not necessarily saying positive or negative in either way, but do you find that that experience is different than coming to the bench as a prosecutor uh, versus a defense lawyer? Right, I, d definitely, because I think where we hear prosecutors say they've handled thousands of cases. Well, we see prosecutors every day in the courtroom, grab a file, skim the offense report, make an offer, and pass it on and they probably never see that file again. And I think to them that counts as handling the case. Whereas when I look up my stats, I think I've handled about 2,700 cases just in Harris County. And I do more than just skim and read the offer and talk to my client. I read the report, often I negotiate with the prosecutor, advise my client, here are your options. Um, and most often I have to look at the evidence, body cameras or videos or witness statements and then people who want to fight their case, I've got to get it ready. So I think as a defense lawyer, we handle cases a lot more thoroughly than prosecutors do. And so I think that experience gives me the edge. We've got a caller on the line to ask you a question. Are you ready? Sure. All right, let's get him on here. Really? Hello, thanks for calling Reasonable Doubt. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Can y'all hear me? We can hear you now. So. I wanted to kind of go back to something that y'all were talking about a minute ago about uh, bond conditions, and uh, I think Ms. Boteo said that that they are to guarantee the safety of the community, and the examples were given about DWI cases giving people interlocks or scram devices and things like that. I have kind of two questions, and I, I want to maybe the, the first one is my, my main one. I have a client, I'm a defense attorney, I have a client who has two vehicles and he has, two mm -hmm. he has a device in each vehicle. Mm -hmm. The court only knows about one of the vehicles mm -hmm. because when he went to get the one installed in his second vehicle, the interlock company told Ooh. him that it's only $20 a month to have the device in there monitoring his alcohol and shutting off the car, locking him out if it detects alcohol mm -hmm. at a certain level in his system. Uh -oh. The additional $50 that everybody ends up paying is a monitoring fee, supposedly, that if, if you wanted to install the device in your car and you are being monitored by a court, it's $75 a month. If you want to install the device in your car and you're not being monitored by a court, for the same device to do the same, to have to serve the same function, it's $20 a month. Why would you and do I think that? that's a pretty big difference. I haven't looked into whether or not that's true, that's but, true. but yeah. my client, he has been paying this for years. He's paying about $95 a month for two devices, and it, he's told by, the, by Intoxilock that if, if mm. the court has to monitor both devices, it'll go up to $160 a month. So given that that's what things are and that people are strapped and not able to pay for some of these devices, are there ways that the judiciary can save people money instead of these one-size-fits-all bond conditions? And then along those same lines, is it really true and fair to say that these kind of things guarantee the safety of the community? Because on one hand, you have somebody who has a device in their car. They cannot drive that car if, they're, if they have alcohol in their system mm -hmm. above a certain amount, a very low amount, um, not legally intoxicated, much lower than that. It locks mm -hmm. the car out completely. Mm -hmm. But why? what safety is there in the community if someone who's only been charged with a DWI and has an interlock in their car, why can't they drink at, in their own home or in a drinking establishment? Not, not, I'm not talking about public intoxication. I'm not talking about assaults that come from – I'm just talking about the person who wants to have one or two beers after work, but they're on bond for DWI. Mm -hmm. If they're not going to be driving and they can't drive the vehicle that they have if they drink a certain amount – drink at all, yeah. then – what guarantee is there to the safety of the community? Or is this really more of just a, an easy way to revoke bonds 
Hmm. If a judge wants to do that, and I know that's a lot, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there and see what that you is think a about lot, caller. Thank you for. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to take question one or question twenty-five? <laughs> <laughs> Which one do you want well, to start I, with? Well, I think I do need to. If I don't think interlocks guarantee the safety of the community, I just think the condition is a a helpful safeguard for the community because I don't know if you missed this part of the response I gave earlier, but the number of citizens in Harris County far outweigh the number of law enforcement. So if somebody is pulled over for DWI, it's pretty bad driving or there was an accident. And I think those drivers should be monitored just to make sure that they are not drinking and driving. Although having a drink and then getting behind the wheel is not illegal, if you're charged with DWI, I don't think it's because you had a drink. I think that's a very minority of cases. I think it's multiple, multiple drinks. But um, ultimately, it's, it's to be a safety measure. And I don't know that everyone is on a blow schedule. A blow schedule is when people have to blow in certain, between certain hours of the day, like from, what, like Seven, 6 to 8, 11, one, lunchtime. Eight, right. right. So not everyone's on a blow schedule. So it is possible for people who had an interlock to, say, drink at home, as long as they're not trying to you know, go get some late night takeout after they're drinking and blowing into their machine, th that shouldn't be a problem. But it, it's a problem when they're going to bars, happy hour, having way too many margaritas, and then getting behind the wheel. So um, what's your stance on, uh, j it, it was mouthwash, Judge. It was mouth. <laughs> that's a joke. You hear it all the time. I know. Uh, you know, you're not supposed to do those things. Anyways, so. Let's talk about, right, uh, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Poorly executed joke, yes, but it was, it was a joke. So, okay, so let's talk about bonds. Let, you, you've referenced the, uh, the bail reform mm -hmm. lawsuit. Um, uh, earlier this week, there uh, was a news article mm -hmm. uh, that talked about the probable cause judges getting uh, sanctioned or reprimanded. Yeah. Um, for not granting PR bonds. For not granting PR bonds. I will say today, uh, Judge Harris in the jail docket gave a number of PR bonds to, to my clients, which was which was great, because I thought she didn't really like me much. But mm. turns out that she was just following the law and doing what she needed to do. Mm -hmm. um, so what is what is your opinions uh, or feelings on the bail? Uh, system as it is now post lawsuit mm -hmm. so pr bonds unsecured bonds pr bond unsecured 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 bond well it's an injunction it's at the injunction stage right now and i think uh i think they're waiting on a decision from the fifth circuit about whether it needs to stay in place or if we revert back but i don't think we're ever going to revert back because it was brought to everyone's attention not just defense lawyers but prosecutors judiciary public that people charged with crimes like driving while license invalid, uh, those people were being held in jail with like $5,000 bonds or $3,000 bonds. And, and the only reason they don't have the license is more than likely due to not paying money to DPS. And so that was, you know, the term debtor's prison. <coughs> and I think people charged with those types of crimes should definitely get PR bonds so that they can get back to work, get on a plan to start paying that money, um, so I think PR bonds for those types of folks are, are great. It's, it's the unsecured bonds that I have an issue with because I've had multiple, I've represented multiple people since this new change that have some mental health issues and they'll get like a criminal trespass. They go in jail, they get out, they get another criminal trespass and it's just like a revolving cycle and right. it's not good. Cause by, by the time someone says, whoa, 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 wait, that person's got five cases. And then somebody's finally saying, wait, 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 what's going on? And so that's a problem that needs to be solved. And the unsecured bonds, we don't have any way to verify where these people are going, how we get a hold of them. So there need, I, I like the verification process with PR bonds. I like that pretrial services makes the call and says, okay, he lives here, this is a number, and we can reach you as a ba backup, great, thank you. Okay, send him on away. That's, that's a good solution to me. You know, as an anecdote to piggyback, I just recently had uh, a trespass, PR bond, trespass, unsecured bond, trespass, unsecured bond, mm -hmm. 
filed a competency evaluation, unsecured bond, so she didn't. <gasps> Right. <laughs> Came back, unsecured bond, filed another competency, unsecured bond, <gasps> got out. Right. And so <laughs> finally, um, I don't know which judge it was, but so finally the judge said, okay, no more. No mas. It's no more. That's no more in Spanish. No mas. Thank you. Right. Um, finally. Which and judge? she came back incompetent. And so f that was a big um, deal for me because this uh, individual... Uh, kept getting out. Mm -hmm. I kept filing for competency evaluations, mm -hmm. and she kept getting out before they could do the competency evaluation, which was a big deal for me. And I said, you know what? There's, there are problems right. with that. Mm -hmm. um, as a general principle, um, what's your opinion on unsecured bonds? I know you said, okay, so on trespasses and, th and driving my license invalids, maybe not. But as a general principle, what are your feelings as far as unsecured bonds? I don't like that the sheriff has become a bondsman. I don't Fair. really like that people are just getting arrested, charged, and then walking out. I like the PR bond system because pretrial services has to verify the information provided. Right. Right. And once it's verified, they're out. And th the defendant can get back to work, get back to family. And I think that is a much better system to follow than the unsecured bond system. And you've also got people getting unsecured bonds charged with misdemeanor assault, um, which is, you know, slap or punch or push or fight, whatever you want to call it, it's still an assault. And that's a crime of violence. And I don't think people charged with assault should get an unsecured bond. I think they, they definitely need, we need to verify, okay, if it was a domestic violence issue, does this defendant have somewhere else to go besides the home? Just to have a cooling off period. Right. Not even to, I'm not even getting into emergency orders for protection, but just to simmer down, cool off. But you mentioned uh, magistrate's orders for emergency protection. What mm -hmm. are your feelings on those or what's your opinions on those? I really, I don't like to see them put in place before the complainant is contacted. Fair. Because it's so difficult for the complainant when... When I represent people and the complainant says, no, I don't want this in place, I, I need my husband in my home or I need my wife, to then approach a judge and say, you know, judge, we really want this removed, she's here, and it's just a difficult situation. So I would rather the, the, the complainant be reached first by the prosecutor. And then if the complainant wants a protective order, move for it at that point, but not prematurely. Now, the magistrate's order for emergency protections um half are in place upon motion of the state. Mm -hmm. So what, how do you envision, every case is different, but how do you envision yourself handling those? Uh, is it like, do you say, oh, well, let's approach the judge and talk to the judge about this MOEP that they're trying to enter first? Or how, I mean, how do you envision that happening? Well, I definitely, if it's not done in front of the magistrates, like most of them are now, I believe, right. I'm definitely, willing to listen to the state's motion to, to have one put on or to defense counsel if, if the complainant wants it removed and the complainant is there to give testimony before the court, I'm definitely willing to listen. Do you think that's a difference? I think it may be. As a defense attorney, we generally we like to say, wait, the guy's presumed innocent. But mm -hmm. as, a, and as a prosecutor, you put your prosecutor hat on, you say, no, let's do the MOEP first. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a difference between maybe what you bring to the table and your opponent brings to the table? Oh, for sure. That's something that, like... For sure. That's wild. It's a big deal. You guys should go out and vote. Like, I mean, whoever <laughs> it is, like, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. It's the classic showdown. You know? It is the classic showdown. Defense lawyer versus prosecutor. Let's talk about dockets. So how are you going to run your docket? Is it... Um, is it... 832, state moves for bond forfeiture granted? <laughs> or is it, I mean, let's talk about your dockets. Mm -hmm. Are, uh, as a judge, you have to balance mm -hmm. the interests of mm -hmm. the community as well as judicial efficiency with your dockets. Yes. So, uh, what, do you have a plan? Have you thought about how you, how you would run a docket? Well, Right now, <laughs> they're running because we're displaced. Um, once the Criminal Justice Center is back open, I'm really curious to see, are the misdemeanor courts gonna be you know, the first 
few floors? Are we gonna have escalators where people can just ride the escalator up instead of having all those elevator issues? Or does the discussion about having an afternoon docket need to be had? I'm definitely willing and open to ideas. I swear to you, if you start talking about Saturday dockets. Oh no, 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 no. Well, but why, uh, but, <laughs> but why can't you, I mean, we go, we, we, we have this argument every time. Why can't you just say, you know, look, initial appearance, motions hearing, trial date. And if you, uh, you know, let me know if you're going to plea by this date and we'll get a plea hearing. Right. And, and then if you run a docket, you know, you have jury selection on Tuesdays, on m uh, Fridays or Mondays or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, trial dates this. And then, you know, Fridays are open uh, or whatever. Fridays are our plea docket or right. Friday, Friday mornings are plea docket. Friday afternoons are motion dockets or or whatever. I mean, you know, that that's what that's what I just. I don't understand because each judge can can set their schedule and and really make things efficient. And I, and I think now, especially where you're sharing courtrooms, we mm -hmm. have limited space. Now is a great time to experiment, yeah, and, and see what what can make things run more efficiently. Um, you know, I, and and getting back to the whole conditions and 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 everything. I mean, I I, I hear what you're saying about safety and trying to figure out, you know, if 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 people who can't afford it can pay for it but uh, in trying to figure out alter alternatives but at the same token I think there's a, a large segment of the population who say you know look yeah I'm sorry that people these people can't pay for it but you know they figured out how to get themselves into this mess you shouldn't have been driving and we're, and we're, and we're what we, they figured out how to get themselves into this mess we're providing them a lawyer the least they can do is pay for whatever conditions the court sees fit mm -hmm. to monitor them on mm -hmm. because let's face it let's be honest here all right defense bar not everybody that is charged is completely 100% innocent, okay? I mean, there, there are some of those that, that do happen where, where people get filed on and, you know, it's, the, the, the charge isn't, isn't right mm -hmm. and you defend it. And yes, I understand that. But by and large, you have a lot of people who are, you know, they're, they're recidivists in the court system. They're coming back through. They're, they're, they're not just one-time DWI people. They're two times and three times and four times. I mean, how many times do you see on the news people getting charged with their sixth DWI? Getting life sentences. Correct. So, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I, I hear you about, about the argument about these people. We need to figure out a way for them to be able to, you know, pay for more reasonable things. But in a lot of situations, these people, you know, figured out a way to get themselves into that position in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think it's unreasonable to try and meet in the middle somewhere. Yes. I mean, okay, maybe we can find something that's that's maybe more economical and affordable. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't, I don't think you can just let them walk out the door. Do you? No. <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, I think wow. for the most part, yes. I, no, <laughs> I don't think so. I, I, I want to. I want to. I want to do that. But God, man, it feels so good walking guilty people out the door, though. Yeah. <laughs> it feels so good, <laughs> man. You're like, boom, you did it, and you and, out. And, and it happens. And, and, and I'm with you, Lori. I think the PR bond is a better situation than, than just going with a complete unsecured bond. Right. Um, you know, because I do think, you know, at the end of the day, what is the purpose of bond? It's to ensure the defendant's appearance in court. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the ultimate goal, right? right? To make sure they come back. Right. And if they don't have at least a little skin in the game, what, what's going to make them come back to court? Right. Going back to... They don't have to be punitive. No, right? that's correct. I, mean, yeah, I, right. I think that's the issue is that, is that for so long, these bonds have been punitive. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And, and, the, and that they're such that they cannot get out at all. And that's wrong. I mean, people should not be held on, on misdemeanor offenses where they can't defend <coughs> themselves. Okay. Mm. But, but, you know, I mean, if you don't have any skin in the game and there's no risk, why, why would you show up? Because, um, I mean, the overriding purpose is to ensure their appearance in court. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, going back to, you know, the unsecured, unse unsecured out, unsecured out, unsecured out. Um, I count on them. Some of them not, like, I'm like, oh, he's not showing up today. <laughs> it would be just fine. 
but he, he's going to pop up in my docket in about a week, and I already know this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Going back to dockets, so do you have, I mean, what's your opinion on docket control orders, scheduling orders? Are you not about that, or is it going to be every day, 30-day uh, reset? I mean, you talked about... I want longer resets. Longer resets. For the cases that call for it. Um, what about defendants' well, appearances? Why can't we just do away with resets? Why can't we do, with the, do away with the whole reset system and just go to a docket control order like every normal court in America does? Because how often does the docket control order actually get followed without a continuance? That's what the judge is for. <laughs> You're supposed to be the referee. Well, and plus... What does the referee do? The referee ensures order, right? The right. referee ensures that you know, that the batter doesn't go take the bat and whack the pitcher's head off. Right. That's what it's supposed to do. So if you have a dock and control order, you say, all right, you bring a motion for continuance, and if you has ca have cause, okay, so defense, what are you asking for? You're asking mm -hmm. for 180 days. State, are you in agreement? Well, no, we, 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 we don't agree. We're opposed. Right. Okay. Defense, I'm giving you 60 days. I'm not giving you the full 180. Right. It, it, just because the defense asks for it doesn't mean they get. I mean, how often are we shut down? A lot. You know, but I mean. But the sheer volume of misdemeanors, right. I think, would prevent docket control orders from feasibly working as, as much as we would want them to. Why? Because so many misdemeanors but are filed every day. But shouldn't a continuance be for good cause? Yes. Okay. But we sometimes, sometimes, the government takes a lot of time to get their evidence. DWI cases is just one example, but what happens when that blood test comes back and it's zero for alcohol? Yeah. Then they send it to Austin for drugs. How long does that take? Like 120. That, but, that, but but that's a that's a that's not every case though. That's true. Okay, I mean, and, and with this new e-file system, if it works like the way we say <laughs> it's supposed to work, you should be able to just pull the continuance up on your screen, right. enter the order, boom, sign it, put the date in, and go. I mean, right. it should. This really shouldn't be a, a a ministerial headache for people. And I don't think it should be. I agree with that. So the, the the ritual of every 30 days a defendant needs to come to court. I think that's an archaic practice, and I'm open to longer resets. But I also think implementing a call docket, which is something I've an idea I've had for a long time. What is that? A call docket. So say you're set for trial on Tuesday. The Thursday before that Tuesday. Just the lawyers need to come in, not the defendant. Lawyers come in and say, judge, we're ready, or no, state's missing this evidence, or defense says, no, I, I have a conflict, I can't try the case. Okay, fine. That way, whenever Tuesday comes, the jury panel can be pulled and know which case is going to trial. There's right. not that game of, ooh, I'm number six, right. but hey, are you five, are you going? Hey, are you four, are you go oh, you're pleading? Okay, ooh, ooh. Right. it eliminates that. So. The lawyers know they're going to trial. The state knows they're going to trial on this case on that Tuesday. Jury panels pulled, sat, board dire. You know who That's does it. that? Uh, District Court Judge Velasquez. And I have found it to be amazing. Yes. I get to go in there to court, no defendant, mm -hmm. talk to the DAs, talk, have a little conference with the judge, and it's your real setting is next week. Mm -hmm. But maybe not if we're talking about it all right now. I get to reset whenever I need to do, or mm -hmm. yes, judge, next Tuesday he's coming in, we're gonna do the plea. Yep. Or yes, judge, next Tuesday we're coming in, we're, we're seating the jury. Right. Um, I found that to be great, and do you, do you feel you can do that in the misdemeanor court? I really do think we can. I think hmm. we can. Because hmm. there's so many cases set for trial on trial day. I don't know about y'all, but I spend my whole weekend prepping, getting everything ready, organizing my binder, just you know, getting ready for the trial. So that when it comes, I show up and I'm ready. So if everything falls apart, which has happened to me, I'm ready to go. Right. But to avoid the drama of that morning, and also to avoid pulling a jury panel and having them sit in the hallway. How many times have you seen that? 30 yeah. people just standing there and just waiting. And just, it's painful for, to see them. And I actually did jury service um, this time last year, and I had broken my foot. And so I was on a knee scooter. Yeah, I don't know if y'all, with the bell, around, yeah. I was wheeling around and I, I, and I was uh, pulled for a jury panel. And I waited for so long and I, was, I had just broken my foot the weekend before and I was supposed to be elevating it. And it was just, it, I was literally in pain, just standing there and trying to elevate my foot and uncomfortable. 
And so I thought, gosh, there's a better way to do this. As Charles Barkley would say, that's terrible. <laughs> terrible. Okay, so. Oh, oh we got phone a phone call. We got a phone call. Oh. Let's, uh, j what? No, it's a phone. I'm excited. Yeah, you got oh. phone call number two here. <laughs> Hello, thanks for calling Reasonable Doubt. Hello. 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 Hola. Nope. Nope. Nobody there. Oh. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? We can now. Okay, thank you for taking my call. Um, I had a few comments and a question about um, the unsecured bond um, uh, comments that you guys made earlier and for the candidate um, who mentioned that um, she doesn't like them. Um, I'm a defense lo lawyer, and prior to the federal injunction, I had uh, several clients who were admittedly homeless and whom I made constitutional arguments for to the judge to have them uh, released on PR bonds. Mm -hmm. And, of course, due to pretrial services being <laughs> unable to verify their residence or any contact information, they were not granted PR bonds. And I found that to be troublesome for a couple of reasons, but um, I think the most important one was that the judge would tell me that he didn't have a problem with them getting a PR bond as long as it was okay uh, with pretrial services, and all of those homeless clients who were later released because that federal injunction happened to come out at that time ended up coming to court. Mm -hmm. And it was a big surprise to me, and I'm sure it was a big surprise to everyone. So um, the, the comment I have is, how can you tell that someone's not going to come to court because they happen to be homeless? And how can you keep them in jail or not give them a PR bond or an unsecured bond because you think that they might act a certain way because of their financial or socioeconomic situation. Mm -hmm. And um, what what steps would you recommend in lieu of giving them unsecured bonds um, since the sheriff is having to act as a bondsman now? Mm -hmm. And um, the other comment I had uh, slash question, question is um, <laughs> the fees for pretrial services or bond um, mm -hmm. conditions or even pretrial intervention programs are oftentimes cumbersome. Mm. And when you've got clients who are homeless or don't have family support mm -hmm. or who are 17 years old dealing mm -hmm. with other issues or 18 years old, um, obviously they're having to pay these cumbersome fees is not helping reduce recidivism or it would be reduced now. So what alternatives would you recommend in lieu of some of these conditions um, and isn't getting a warrant issued for you if you fail to come to court um, enough government intervention to secure your presence? And I'll take your comments off air. Thank you. Thanks. Oh. We need to teach these <laughs> defense lawyers to confine their questions to yeah. a couple. That's a that's that's what I'm talking about, Lori. You're about to make some tough decisions. Yeah. yeah. You know what? These people are indigent. They can't afford those bond conditions. These and and just because someone's accused, as you know, mm -hmm. don't mean they're guilty. Right. How are you going to balance that? So, yeah, that's tough. That's um, tough. <laughs> that was a really good. Uh, I have also represented homeless people. I understand it's hard. I really, whenever I've had the chance, I've referred uh, some of my clients to social workers who work for the public defender's office. Did you know our public defender's office had social workers? They have social workers to help guide them because some people don't even have an ID. Right. So where do they go to get that? Because they need certain information. And it's nice to be able to, to say, okay, I've talked to the social worker. Here are the resources that I can get for you. I don't think that just because someone is homeless, that person should have to remain in jail. It's 7.45, dude. Oh. And, um, You're an hour off. That, that was a secret. Oh, my bad. So I just think it's, I think it's, it's got to be looked at case by case. If, if a defense lawyer brings a homeless person in front of me and, and we need to talk about, uh, whether it's at a jail docket or a bond docket, to say these bond conditions are too cumbersome, can't afford them, what alternatives can we look at? I will definitely be open to exploring alternatives. Well, well but I think that's the point, is that each case needs to be dealt with and, and looked at and you know, dealt with on an individual level. We're, and, and, and we shouldn't be trying to shoehorn everybody into one set of right. facts or circumstances or conditions. It's not a one-size-fits-all deal. It shouldn't right. be. And, uh, you know, 
and we can always sit here and we can always talk about, well, the homeless this and the homeless that. The reality is if you walk up and down the halls of the criminal courthouse every day, mm -hmm. it is not filled with homeless people who are coming to dock it, okay? It's just not. Mm -mm. It, 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 th th that's, you know, th they're, they're, it's not there. Now, is that because they're in custody? Is that because they've been, what, what's the real story? But when you look out in the audience, okay, yes, you have a mix of people who are sitting there in suits who have clearly, you know, come from, from, from means who are charged with DWI because they went out to some high-end club and got their stupid bottle service and got drunk up and decided to drive, you know, their, their car home. Or possession. Uh, or possession of cocaine or possession of marijuana or whatever. You've got that mixed in with the guy who is, you know, working down at the plant. I mean, you, you've got all, you've got all every types. different size. All walks okay? of life. Yep. It, th this isn't this, you, you can't just put everybody into the same system and, and make it work for everyone. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree that we've got to find a solution for everybody. Uh, but we, we, we can't just, in my opinion, we always just want to go to the very worst case scenario <laughs> and say, well, the whole system has to change because this person who's the very worst case scenario. And it's not like that. We're leaving out all the people in the middle. Right. You know, and that, that, that is what's happening across the board in our country today. We're worrying about the people at the top and we're worrying about the people at the bottom. And everybody in the middle, where's the middle? Hey, crapped on. Yeah. What about me? Yeah. What about so, me? So, you know, I mean, it, 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 there, the, each case needs to be looked at mm -hmm. on an individual level. For sure. And, you know, the question is functionally, how do we make that work? I mean, if, if our system is so overloaded that we can't have a docket control order to, mm. uh, then, mm. then how do we bring individual bond questions before a judge? Mm -hmm. well, 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 we could certainly, I think with this. Seems to me if you had a docket control order, you might have more time. <laughs> You really want address? a docket controller. Well, okay. well, it seems like you might be able to free up time on a Monday yeah. if you're not doing stuff to say, hey, well, here's let's have bond hearings on Monday. Bring your bring right. your, bring your bond appeals to me, everybody. Hmm. I'm just... That's a, that's a good idea. I'm thinking out loud no, here. No, no, you, you can't. You know why? Because then you're going to have to work past 1 o'clock. That's okay. Ooh, I said it. Ooh, Ooh. I said it. Burn. I said it. It's not a burn for me. I work past 1 o'clock. <laughs> oh, yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's something I definitely want to look at. Got to look at the options. And I think a big change, we're doing the e-filing, but so is the state. The state is now, instead of printing out their files, everything is going to be online well, in the their portal. So yeah. we don't necessarily need to have a specific setting so that they can bring their file. Right. We can come and approach as long as the defendant's present, because I think the defendant always needs to be there. When Why? We're talk because we're talking about that person's case. Okay. Fair enough. It's not okay. it's not the defense lawyer's case. I can make all the arguments I want. I go home. I don't have to blow into an interlock. So, so here's enough. the other That's question. Good. You say it's at the DA's portal. Mm -hmm. I only see one portal in the courtroom. On on your iPad? <laughs> no, I'm, I only see the DA's only have one computer sitting there. Oh, they've been bringing laptops. Uh, they okay. got uh, and now they got kiosks. Kiosks. I haven't seen the kiosks, no, but in, I've seen a lot more laptops. Well, they're, uh, yeah. In some courts. They're laptops. Mm -hmm. I say kiosk, but they're oh. laptops now. Oh. And they hook in. Yeah, they, I think they kiosk, link up. I think like what you have in the mall where you buy your... Everything electronic you can do. Every, on, there's an app for it now. So they don't have to have a setting on a docket to approach. Because I, 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 oh, that, that, that aggravates me. Like, judge, we don't have our file. Well, come on. Can't we still talk about it? Can't you? And... Now that we're not in the criminal justice system and the file is blocks away, they can't go get it. But now things are going to be accessible online. Reports, we can have conversations without necessarily having it on a docket. Okay, Laura. Um, what's the role of the judge, of a judge, in pretrial interventions? What's the role? What, are you stepping in? You're not stepping in? Uh, is it your place to say? What's your opinion on that? So on my... On my campaign data, and please go to www.lauriboteo.com. Um, I'm going to let parties make pretrial agreements. Mm. I don't want to be one who interferes because I, I've been in that situation where I've negotiated something for my client. My client wants it. The state wants it. And then we have to go to the judge, and then we start being asked, well, what are the facts of the case? And it's the agreement's done, judge. Can't we just get the year-long reset, I, I want to say I'm not going to have a problem with that. I can see where some judges do, but I want to let the parties make agreements. You know, 
You're exactly right. State wants it. Defense wants it. Um, it's my it's my opinion. I agree with your opinion. <laughs> uh, but uh, we see it. Mm -hmm. um, and not all judges do it. Not all judges do that. It's not a consistent thing that all judges do. But right. there are some who are known for saying, mm, no, can't do it. And it's it, that the judge hasn't been a party to the negotiations that have gone on, to, you know, the emails and the, you know, here's... Here are the circumstances, the behind the scenes facts, aside from the facts of the case. And so I, I don't want to interfere. If the parties are ready to make an agreement. Well, then let me ask you this. That individual on the pretrial intervention is going to have to be supervised, uh, let's say, via an interlock or via mm -hmm. your analysis or via a patch. And we'll still be on bond. And still be on bond. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be using uh, resources from the Harris County taxpayers. Probation department. Right. Our community supervision department. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't think that the judge should have a say in that kind of stuff? If there's if there's a bond violation, because the person will still be on bond right. during the pretrial agreement. So if there's a bond violation, then yes, there will have to be a court date to have a conversation about what's going on. The DA's office is always open to changing their policy. They can make an agreement, dismiss the case, and if there's a violation of the agreement, DA can refile. Like the rest of the planet. That hasn't happened. So we have it currently the way it is. Maybe maybe there'll be a change. I don't know. A lot can happen in a few months. We'll see. Mm. Again, you, you just, you, you, you can't win, though. <laughs> but I can win. If no, you no, vote no, for no me. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about that. But I mean, <laughs> you, you, you're going to, what I mean is, if you win it, if you win the mm -hmm. bench, you know, you're going to have people who are okay with your policies of, mm -hmm. of, of doing certain things. And, and I know there's a split, and, and I know we only have a minute left, but I mean, I know there's a, there's a split in the Republican Party right now mm -hmm. because we saw it in the last election, we saw a lot of Republicans who voted for uh, Kim Og mm -hmm. as opposed to Devin Anderson. And there's a, a, I would say, a pretty even split in the Republican Party right now uh, of those who want serious criminal justice reform versus those who want to keep the system status quo. And so, uh, I mean, wh what do you think is going to happen uh, locally with those? Because, I mean, it seems like the, the races that you, where you have two candidates, mm -hmm. that's where the divide is. Yeah. The ones who want criminal justice reform from the Republicans and the, and the ones who want to keep it the status quo. I just, I'm encouraging everyone who has questions or feedback or comments to talk to me. I'm trying to meet as many voters as I can because I'm truly running a grassroots style campaign with support of family and friends and colleagues. So I'm just trying to get the word out about what I want to do, that I have ideas, that I have the energy to bring it all to the table. And uh, I'm hoping to earn, earn the vote so that I, I win the primary and face the uh, Democrat in the general. Hashtag earn it. That's all the time we got. Nice. We gotta wrap this sucker up. So, huh? Yeah, that was fun. Well, time was flies on the show. I know. We wow. Appreciate, we appreciate you coming <laughs> on. Uh, that's all the time we have for this week, ladies and gentlemen. For Lori Bateo, Julio Vela, I'm Jimmy Ardwan. We will see you next week. We actually won last night, didn't we? What? Pardon? The horns. Yeah. Yeah, well, we did. Know. Basketball. Yeah. LoriBateo.com. There you Thank go. You. That's all we got, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. Good night.